Take your Bible this morning, if you would please, for our scripture reading to Luke chapter 1, please. Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Luke 1 for our scripture reading. We're going to read verses 5 through 13. Luke 1, verses 5 through 13. We read the verses responsibly as we normally do, begin together on verse 5, and I'll read 6, and we'll alternate till we end together on verse 13 of Luke chapter 1. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 5 of Luke chapter 1. Ready? There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. <clears throat> and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of the incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And let's pray. <clears throat> Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the good music today and for the good spirit in this place. And Lord, we're so grateful for the uh, privilege we have to open up your word together. I pray, Lord, that each of us would give our attention to the word of God this morning. Lord, I pray that none of us would miss what you have for us today. Lord, help us to focus and uh, tune our heart to your heart. And may the special be used for that purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Gentle Mary laid her child
Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of the Word of God. Once again, Lord, I want to thank you for the Bible, and Lord, we want to thank you for the Christmas season that allows us to think about the surroundings of the coming of Christ, His birth into this world, and so many wonderful characters and people that we can draw our attention to that were part of His story. And I pray you'd help us this morning as we look at this other child in the Christmas story and uh, glean some truths from uh, this part of the coming of Christ, that it would be a help and encouragement and a challenge to each of the people present here this morning. Lord, I pray you'll take your truth now from your word and put it into the hearts of people this morning. Give each one individually what they need and only you can give. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I don't know if you've ever looked now with the wonderful uh, use of the internet of who you share your birthday with. I, I share my birthday with Jackie Robinson, the first black baseball player, at least professionally. Ernie Banks, famous Ch Mr. Cub, Chicago Cub. You don't know sports, it doesn't mean anything to you, but... Uh, Nolan Ryan, some of you might have heard of him, and uh, they, we share the same birthdays. And uh, I looked up December 25th, Clara Barton was born on December 25th, 1821, founder of the American Red Cross. Conrad Hilton of the Hilton Hotel chain, uh, December 25th, 1887. Um, Humphrey Bogart, an actor, 1899, also born on Christmas Day. And uh, <clears throat> while the person we're going to look at this morning doesn't share the same birthday as Jesus, he is certainly an important part in the story and in the birth, in the whole coming of Jesus Christ to the earth the first time. He, um, he was still important. He's not as important as the Christ child, but he was important. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 1, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And so, John also was one sent from God. He would be a cousin to Jesus, and he would grow to be very famous as well. Now, he had some wonderful parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And that's where we'll pick up our story here for this morning. And I want to give you the first uh, point here, right off, with Zacharias and Elizabeth, and that is this. Godly people sometimes have great disappointments. Godly people sometimes have great disappointments. Notice with me in verse 5, where we read this morning in Luke 1. There were in the days of Herod, king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both, and they were both, they both were now well stricken in years. Zacharias was a priest. Not only was his wife a descendant of Aaron, but he would be as well. Uh, priests in those days would serve from 30 to 50. They had 20 years to serve, and at 50, they had mandatory retirement. Boy, does that sound pretty good. But uh, they, they, they served those 20 years, and they could serve on special occasions after that. But their dream and their prayer was to have a child. And, and probably not just a child, but a son. That was to carry on the name and the name to live on. And it was, by the way, very important in their society. Uh, children were considered to be a blessing from the Lord. And not to have children, you were considered cursed. That, that God did not bless you with children. And so we understand it wasn't for lack of trying. It's that Elizabeth was barren. God had not opened her womb and allowed her to bear children. And so they prayed and they pleaded with God for a son. 
And they lived right. Did you look at verse 6? It says, they were both righteous before who? God. Hey, this isn't man saying they were good people. This is God saying they were righteous. They were righteous before me. So they were righteous in the sight of God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Boy, they, 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 they lived exactly as they ought to live. But year after year, year after year, year after year, and no child. No child came. Now, the childbearing years are past. In fact, retirement's very near. And I imagine they stopped praying about it, at least publicly. At least saying anything about it, even to one another maybe. And I'm reminded that good and godly people are not exempt from great disappointments. Some struggle with infertility. Some get downsized out of jobs. Some are diagnosed with cancer. Elijah battled discouragement and depression. David had a very rebellious son, tried to take the kingdom from him. Adam and Eve had a son that was a murderer. Paul had fellow laborers leave him, and he had no one to stand with him. But you understand, verse 6 told me and tells us that they were both righteous before God. That they both were living the way God would want them to live. And so I understand that the disappointments of life are not necessarily the judgments of God upon your life. Sometimes we look at people and we say, well, I know why that happened to them. And you know what? You have no earthly idea why that's happened to them. <clears throat> Though their disappointments and they, they were disappointed and their dreams were unfulfilled, you know what's great? They lived for God anyway. They continued to be blameless. They continued to keep all the ordinances and all the commandments. They continued to do everything and be faithful to God whether they got what they wanted or not. Oh, how many times I run into people who aren't living for God and won't go to church and don't want anything to do with God and it all stems back to where well, I asked God for something and He didn't come through. I asked God for this to happen and it didn't happen and I'm done with God. <clears throat> Would you live for God? Would you love God? Would you continue to be faithful to God even when you don't get what you want? Even when you don't get what you pray for? J. Oswald Smith had a deep longing to become a missionary but he was turned down by several missionary societies on the grounds of poor health. And so he made a commitment that if I cannot go myself, I'll send someone else. And he began a church called the People's Church in Ontario, Canada. He pastored there for several decades. And during that period of time, he, he, he made 21 world tours promoting evangelism and missions. He began a faith promise missions in his church by which they would support missionaries over and above the normal offering of the church. And he led that church to support over 500 missionaries worldwide. Many of those hundreds of missionaries called into service under the preaching of J. Oswald Smith. And we come to find out that not only did he wrote, he wrote 35 books, he wrote over 1,200 hymns. What a great influence upon missions he had and missionaries being called to the field. And he found out something. You know what he found out? Oftentimes, our disappointments are God's appointments. Our disappointments are God's appointments. Did you know something? Broken-hearted servants, broken-hearted people make compassionate servants of God. You know... God always breaks before He uses. Because when you've been broken, then you have compassion. And you care and you understand others. 
You think about disappointment, I think about Mary and Joseph. You think how disappointed that it must have been for Mary's parents who were probably dreaming of their daughter's wedding and how wonderful it would be. You ever think how disappointed they were when Mary has to break the news to them? I'm expecting a child. And, and totally understand, don't, don't think about it in the frame of today, in, in our generation. Think about what it was like then. Where Joseph would have had every right to, to really not only have her put away, but even to have her killed. And he thought about putting away privately. What a disgrace that would have been. I'm sure there was disappointment. I'm sure disappointed in Mary. Though she would be excited that, that, hey, God has chosen me and that's a great honor, but I won't have a wedding like everybody else. I won't get to be normal. Joseph the same way. I'm sure as they would go through town or anytime anyone would walk by, there'd be people whispering to each other. They'd figure out what they're talking about and who they're, who they're whispering about. But I'm going to ask you a question. Was their disappointment God's appointment? Sure was. That's how Jesus would come into the world. So remember, you're not, nobody's exempt from great disappointments. Do you think that, that you were going to go through life and never have disappointment? Never, never get things that you thought you should have? Or never have answers that you think you deserve? Or never have heartache or trials or just disappointments. But would you remember that oftentimes our disappointments are God's appointments? Let me give you a second thought this morning. They had a supernatural surprise. This is an amazing thing. Zacharias is going about his duties in the temple, and an angel appears to him. Okay? Now this is not a this is not an everyday thing, okay? Uh, it was a pretty frightening thing. In fact, the Bible says fear fell on fell upon Zacharias when the angel uh, appeared to him. In verse thirteen, he says, "Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Thou shalt call his name John." Now Zacharias couldn't quite believe it. Go back down to verse eighteen. <coughs> verse eighteen, please. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. I'm glad she didn't, he didn't say she's an old woman. He just said she's well stricken in years. And, and he's saying, man, I'm, we're, we're past the time. And notice what the angel says, verse 19. He says, answer, the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. And I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. I mean, he says, how's this going to happen? He says, wait a minute, don't you know who I am? I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. God sent me to tell you this. And you're wondering how it's going to happen? God, Zacharias, God sent me to tell you this. God's going to take care of it. But here's your sign, since you want a sign. Verse number 20. Behold, thou shalt be dumb. Well, that's not hard for most men, is it? But that's not talking about being not intelligent. That's talking about you're not going to talk, okay? No, no speech. Thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words, which, you, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Wow. Let me ask you a question now. If God, if you prayed and prayed and prayed, and then eventually you stopped praying because you hadn't gotten an answer, and then all of a sudden an angel appears to you and says, I've come from the presence of God, your prayer is heard, God's going to answer it. Would you be a bit surprised? Would you maybe think, whoa, 
what? How, 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 how's that going to happen? You would be amazed, maybe skeptical. But God was going to do something great. All this is beginning to happen. The fullness of time has come. And God's going to send forth His Son into the world. It's a big plan. It's a plan, the Bible says, that was formed in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. And guess what? Zacharias and Elizabeth, they get to be a part of it. And they had no idea. No idea whatsoever. They were part of a bigger plan. Part of a bigger picture. Did you know there's a bigger picture than just you and me? You ever think about how you fit into the big picture? Hmm? That was a plan of God. This elderly couple would be part of God's plan. Can I help you with something? God always operates on His time, not our time. Do you understand? God has a calendar, and it's different than mine. Do you understand that? And by the way, it's different than yours. God, God is never, God is not bound by time. That's why God said when they say, "What is it?" Moses said, "Who am I going to say sent me?" He says, "You tell them that I am sent you." He is the great I am, not I was or I will be. I am because God always operates in the present. There's not bound by time. We look at things as time. Next Sunday is Christmas Eve. Tonight at 5.30. You have to be at work at 6 or 7 tomorrow morning or 8 o'clock. You see, we, we're all tall about time. God's not concerned about time. He's not bound by time. He's not bound by age. Didn't matter to Him how old they were. You see, we pray and we don't receive the answer. And, and we, we, we forget. We think, well, it's too late now. Well, based on whose calendar? Yours or God's? Well, it'll never work now. Well, based on whose time? Yours or God's? And you know, God may be waiting and God may be holding off the answer to your prayer because you might be part of something much bigger that God wants to do. And so He's waiting for the right time to bring that answer to your prayer. God may have a big surprise in mind. So I see, number one, that godly people can have great disappointments. And I see, number two, that godly people can also have some supernatural surprises. But I see, number three, godly people can have interruptions. Oh, there was a great excitement at Zechariah and Elizabeth's house. He came out of the temple. Verse 21, they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And verse 22 says, when he came out, he couldn't speak unto them and they perceived that he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And so it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. <clears throat> so they were excited. They tried to hide it for as long as they could. Five months. She hid it. Until finally, she couldn't hide it any longer. I mean, maybe the clothes weren't fitting. Maybe people were wondering, you, you're gaining quite a bit of weight here, Elizabeth. What's happening? Maybe she found out and she finally had to say, Zacharias, you know, maternity outfits aren't covered under Medicare. We need some help here. But when word began to trickle out, man, everybody was excited. How can this happen? How can you be expecting? But wait, Gabriel isn't finished. Look down at the next verse with me. Verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and the angel came in unto her and said hail thou that art highly favored the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women 
And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Oias shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then Gabriel lets her in on their secret. He says, Behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Well, how in the world can that happen? Verse 37. With God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. There's a reason, I think. I mean, you imagine this, this teenage girl. Accounts vary, nobody knows for sure. But, but Mary could have been 14, 15, probably no older than 16 years of age. They got betrothed or engaged uh, early in, in Bible times. It was not unusual. All the arrangements, you know, were, were prearranged. They were set up by mom and dad. And so she was engaged or betrothed to Joseph. And the announcement comes now that, that Mary is going to give birth to the Christ child, the promised Messiah. And Mary is, is a little taken back, but she says, Be it unto me according to thy word. I mean, how exciting. How unbelievable. But now, you have to ask yourself the question, who does she tell? You don't run out and just tell everybody, hey, an angel just came to me and I'm going to bear the Christ child. <laughs> sure you are. I don't know this for a fact. I've heard it said that, that there were other virgins in that day and, and because of their promiscuity, they would use that as a crutch or as excuse. And of course, it was false. So who am I going to talk to about this? You know what's great? Look what, look what the Bible says. Verse 38, verse 39, And Mary arose in those days, so now the angel departed. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste. She got on it, man. And a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Who's she going to go tell? Elizabeth! Why? Gabriel said, hey, she's going to have a child. God has visited her. Oh, well, who am I going to tell? I'm going to go tell Elizabeth. It's an amazing thing. She takes off to see her with haste, her in a hurry. Elizabeth is, is amazing. This is an amazing encounter. Notice what it says in verse 41. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice, saying, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. <coughs> and Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary goes on and talks about all that the Lord has done for her. It's an amazing uh, conversation here that takes place. But you know what's amazing? Elizabeth doesn't talk about her baby at all. She only talks about Mary. Mary comes with the big news and the excitement and, and, and that's all that Elizabeth cares to talk about. She doesn't say, oh, well, let me tell you what happened to me. Isn't that what most of us do? Oh, oh, that happened to you. Well, let me tell you about the time this happened to me. 
And, and you have, you, every one of us, we know people that whenever you tell them something, they're going to tell you something to top it. Don't be that person. And you know what's great? She was filled with the Holy Ghost. And when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't think about yourself. You think about others. You think about others. She doesn't demand the spotlight. She doesn't tell Mary her news. She doesn't take the attention from Mary at all. One of the great characteristics of godliness is the ability and the desire to celebrate the success of somebody else. That you're thrilled when someone else is blessed by God. Ungodliness and flesh always will find fault with the achievement of others. Ungodliness and flesh always finds fault with the achievement of others. You see somebody drive in the parking lot and they got a new car. You ought to say, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you got a new car. I'm glad God blessed you with a good vehicle. Or do you think, how come I can't get a new car? How come God doesn't give me one? See, it all depends on whether you're godly or whether you're in the flesh. You find fault? Hey, preachers can be guilty of that. Oh, we had a great revival. We had hundreds saved. Eh, how many of them really meant it? wonder how many of them were genuine. Oh, God's blessing our church and we're growing and we're seeing this. Eh, well, they don't take a stand like we do. If they took a stand like we did, they wouldn't have. You see? Instead of rejoicing. That God's blessing them. Amen. Praise the Lord. You see, you have to uh, the, the 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 godliness and the being filled with the Spirit always rejoices in the success of someone else. When God blesses another Christian, rejoice. God blesses another church, rejoice. Praise the Lord. Christmas and the Christian life is not about you. It's not about focusing on yourself. It's rejoicing in someone else's happiness. Can you be happy because someone else is happy? Okay, you don't have... I was at the Speedway getting my tea in the morning and the ladies there was talking about, well, I, I don't have any family. You know, just, just myself. And she goes, I guess on the bright side... I don't have to spend much money for presents. <laughs> I don't have to buy for my family then because they're not here anyway. I say, well, you got to stay on the bright side. Amen? But listen, you, you, can, you, can have, you, can have, you have you have a choice. Christmas time comes and your family's not here. Or you're, you're, you think you're by yourself. You can mully grub and think, oh, everybody got family. I don't have anybody. Or you could rejoice that people have family to spend their time with. And you can pray for them and rejoice because they're rejoicing. You can be happy because they're happy. What's your choice? Or you can get in the molly grubs and you can get down and just look at yourself and wonder what you don't have. Depression around Christmas time is because you're focused on you and not on others. Always is the case. The rest of Luke 1 after Mary is done, verse 57, she stays there for three months and then returns to her house. And Elizabeth, verse 57, full time was come that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. And the whole rest of the chapter isn't about the Christ child. It's about John. It's about the birth of John. He was born six months before Jesus. Was born to Mary. John's life really was a fulfillment of prophecy from the Old Testament and of course, a fulfillment of prophecy by the angel Gabriel. Now he'd be different. It's interesting. Notice verse number 80, the last verse of the chapter about John in, in Luke 1. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. So he had a little different kind of upbringing. You find out later on, John, he wore camel's hair. 
and he ate wild locusts. Not your normal diet. Not normally what people would want to be around. He was a different individual. But he was 100% committed to Jesus Christ. He was 100% surrendered to do what God wanted him to do. By believing the message that he preached, and they would come and be baptized, declaring their faith in the one who's coming after him, the latchet of whose shoes he's not worthy to unloose. John knew his role was to prepare the way for the Lord coming. He knew that. In fact, in Luke 1 and verse number 17, the angel tells Zacharias about John. He'll go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He's preparing the way. He knew that. He wasn't there to just to get a following for himself. He said himself that he, Jesus, must increase and I, John, must decrease. In other words, he's gonna, you're going to get more and more of Jesus and less and less of John. That was Jesus' first coming. Can I tell you that he's coming again? There is a second coming. Now John isn't here to prepare people for a second coming. Who is here? We are. Well, our job is to prepare people for His return. To make people ready to meet the Lord. That's our job. We're to be pointing folks to Jesus. And how you point folks to Jesus is, as you grow in your Christian life, there needs to be more and more of Him and less and less of me. He must increase. I must decrease. John would say, I am nothing and he is everything. He was pointing people to the one who would come after him. And we are pointing people to the one who is coming after us to receive us to himself. And we're pointing folks to Jesus Christ. Again, it isn't about me. It's not about you. It's always about him. It's always about pointing people to Jesus. Instead of at Christmas time thinking, what am I getting or who am I going to be with or who's going to be around me? Say, who can I point to Jesus this year? Who can I point to Christ? Can I take somebody something to eat? Can I give somebody a gift? Can I spend time with somebody? Can I visit with somebody? Can I pray for somebody? Can I just do something for others that will point them to Jesus? (coughs) One week till Christmas. One week from tomorrow. Will you point people to Jesus? Will you focus on you? Or will you focus on Him in the next seven days? I'd like us to be like John. I want you to go to the Gospel of John in chapter 10 with me, would you please? Jesus is now in His ministry. And He's he's talking to the Jews who, if you look up in verse 31, the Jews took up some stones to stone Him. And Jesus tells them, I've done many good works and I've showed you from My Father which of the works do you stone Me? And the Jews said, It's not for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus quotes some Scripture to them, and it says the Scripture can't be broken. And if you go down in verse 37, He says, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe me not, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in Him. Therefore they sought again to take Him, but He escaped out of their hand, 
And notice verse 40, He went away again beyond Jordan unto the place where John at first baptized. And there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, first thing they said, John did no miracle. Hey, look here. First thing to notice is this is the people's commentary now about John. And they said, you know, John didn't do any miracles. But what did Jesus say about John in another place? He said, among those who have been born of women, there's never risen a greater than who? John the Baptist. Are you worried about God doing some great miracles through you or in you? That's not the important thing. John was great. None greater. And he never did a miracle. These places where, oh, got to have a miracle every week. i got to have a miracle every service. got to have a miracle going on all the time. John never did a miracle. And there's never been a greater born of women than John the Baptist. Well, what made John great then? Why would Jesus say that? Notice what the rest of it they said. John did no miracle, but... All things John spake of this man. Who's this man? Jesus. Were true. And many believed on him there. You know what they said about John? Everything he said about Jesus was true. Oh, they didn't point to some miracle they remember John doing. They didn't look back and say, I remember he opened my eyes or he walked on water or he caused the lame man. And he didn't have any miracles to point to. You know what they could say? Everything he said about Jesus was true. And my friend, if you come to the end of your life, or if your life was tragically, if it, if it was, in our eyes, cut short, just recently a, a, a friend of ours that I pastored the girl when she was a teenager, and a friend of she went to, I think, to school with, I think she was only 41 years of age, and she just died of cancer. You see, you may not get 70 years. You may not get 75 years. You may not get 60 years. But if people could look at you and say, you know what? Never saw any miracles. But everything they said about Jesus was true. That's a mighty good testimony. That's a great testimony of the other child in the Christmas story. Why don't you tell somebody about Jesus? There's no better time of year to do it than right now. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It's our job to tell them. Just like the other child did in the Christmas story, John the Baptist. Father, I pray you'll take the truth now this morning. I pray, Lord, that each of us would strive that everything we say about you is true. Lord, I'm praying this morning for godly people in the room who have met some real life disappointments. But this morning I pray that they would realize those disappointments can be God's appointments. I'm sure Joseph was so disappointed when he got sold as a slave. I'm sure he was disappointed when he was thrown into prison. But it was in prison where he met that butler and the baker. And the butler eventually remembered that Joseph could interpret dreams. And you put him second in command only to Pharaoh. Then Joseph saw that his disappointments were your divine appointments. Father, I pray you'd help us to be faithful and to continue to serve you because you have a much bigger plan that we're a part of than just ourselves. I pray, Lord, that we would focus on others and not ourselves. That as we're filled with the Spirit, we would not think about us, we would think of others. Lord, Take the truth to the hearts of people this morning. I pray if any in the room has never received Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day they would say yes to Jesus. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. Right now, just between you and God. I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved today. I know that Jesus 
died for my sins and was buried and rose again. And there's a time when I trusted Him alone as my Savior. If you asked me if I died, I'd go to heaven. I'd say yes. And if you asked me why, I'd tell you I'm trusting Jesus alone as my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony of that fact. Would you slip it up this morning and say, Pastor, that's me. I know I'm saved. I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. All right, you may put him down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. But I'd like to know. I'd like to be certain heaven's my home. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not embarrass you or call you out, but I will pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? Is there someone like that? Couldn't raise it the first time, but you'll raise it now. The message was mainly to believers this morning. I don't know how God spoke to your heart. But if He spoke to your heart this morning and say, Pastor, the Spirit of God dealt with me about some things this morning. And I appreciate you praying for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian, and say, pray for me, Pastor? God spoke to my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over here, thank you. Back here, I see him. Thank you. Anyone else today? Pastor, pray for me. Maybe this morning I see that hand, my friend. Thank you. Maybe today you would just say, you know, Pastor, I need to tell others of him. I need to be more bold in my witness for Christ. And I want to make it my mission to point others to Jesus. That's what John's job was. That's what our job is, to prepare people for the second coming. I wonder if you're here today and say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart about being a more bold witness for Christ and telling others of Jesus. Pray for me that I could be more of a bold witness for Him. Would you slip your hand up and say, That's me. God bless you. Yes, God bless you and you and you. Amen. God bless you. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Why don't you bow the knee? You may need to just bow the knee and say, God, I'm I'm so disappointed. But I realize it may be your appointment. And I'll be faithful like Zachariah and Elizabeth. And you may have something supernatural in mind. Something bigger than me that I'll be a part of. And I'll trust you for that. But whether I get a miracle or not, All things I say about Jesus are going to be true. I'll point others to Him. He will increase in my life. I will decrease. And I'll be faithful to you. Heavenly Father, have your way in this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. I pray that each individual will do as you're bidding them to do in their heart. If any need to receive Christ, I pray they'll come. If any They've been saved and not been baptized. I pray they'd come and say they'd like to be baptized. If they're saved and baptized and they ought to belong somewhere, they ought to come and say, you know, I'd like to belong to Bible Baptist Church and serve the Lord here. For those who just need to come and bow the knee and spend a few moments with you before they go home today, put your arms around them at this altar and let them know that you have a plan. You're involved in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would point others to Jesus with our life. Have your way now in this invitation time, and I'll thank you for it.